I changed my message 15 minutes before the sermon, so it's either going to be really good or really bad. Let's believe it's going to be good. We're starting a new series. It's called The Biography of the Saints. I know that sounds a little, a little uh, religious, maybe a little hyper-spiritual. Whenever you hear the word saint, it might trigger something into your head. But my intention in this series is to strip away all the preconceived ideas about what religion is. I want to strip it all out. I want, I actually, my, my intention, my goal is to make the language that we use sound natural to everyone. It's actually one of the key foundations of the, the founding of this church is that dad took a movement and a young people, and he changed the language, how they were communicating the gospel. He took out the he took out the organ. I actually sold the Leslie Hammond B three. Shouldn't have done that. Um, but we took out the organ. Took out the old King James version. Took out the dressiness of it all. And it was needed. And it changed a culture. It's part of a movement that just radically changed the world in, in many ways that we don't understand. But if you're familiar with contemporary Christianity, well, Dad was on the forefront of that whole thing. And it made a big difference. And yet, we're humans. We have this incredible ability to make things religious to gild our walk with the Lord. And God doesn't want us to have a gilded faith. Now, He wants us to have a pure faith. He wants us to have a passionate faith. But He really doesn't care about all the pretension and all the, all the, the Christianese and the language, even the way that we've done it, you know, in these days, this, this day and time. Now, when you have a conversation about God with your friends and your family, it needs to be one of the most natural conversations that you've ever had. The last thing that you want to do is sound like me or any other pastor on TV. You, you need to sound like you because God has uniquely designed you to communicate his word in a specific way to where your friends, your family, their ears are going to pop open. They're going to listen. And I really want to make this church a comfortable place for absolutely anyone to come in and sit down and feel comfortable and not threatened, and at the same time, get wrecked by God, get shooken up. Now, that was another word that God gave me today. It's like there's a shaking, like he wants to shake you. He wants to, 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 to rattle your cage a little bit, and that's okay. He's not a mean God. He's just, he's a shaker. And so in this series on the biography of the saints, of course, we're going to be talking about saints. And I'm looking at modern saints. I mean, ones that aren't alive anymore, but I'm not going to do like the patristic fathers or something like that. We're going to talk about some very specific saints, some that you might know. Um, John Wimber. So we're going to do the biography of John Wimber in two weeks. I was going to do it next week, but it's Super Bowl Sunday. So we're going to do a part two on this sermon today. If you don't know what that means, is that Super Bowl Sunday is going to be a light Sunday. It's just the reality of it, and I'm accepting it. <laughs> okay, because you gotta, you have to, you guys have to scrub down your barbecues. <laughs> it's not my first rodeo, folks. I know what to expect. Amy Simple McPherson. Some of you may or may not know who she is. Uh, Billy Graham, oh, amen. amen, most likely Chuck Smith, and a few others. I want to talk about these, like these pillars, like these saints. But my intention is not to put another pastor on a pedestal. My intention is to say these people were like you. These people have a calling. These people had gifts. These people, they, they walked in the fulfillment of God. And you can too. Yeah. And the, the purpose of it, again, you have to put up with me because I'm going to get history lesson on you. I'm going to you know, geek out on stuff, whatever. But the intention is that we're going to equip you during this season. This is, a, this is an equipping series. 
Because I've been, if you've been hanging out with us, you've been hearing it a lot that the Lord doesn't want to view you as a sinner anymore. Once you take this communion, once you drink of this cup, once you eat of this bread, once you ask for the forgiveness of your sins, you, may, you move out of syndom and you move into sainthood. So we have to break the bond and the oppression of a slave mentality that says, I am nothing but a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. True statement. But it's not a true reality. The reality is is that we are saints. We are called into sainthood. Every single one of you is called into sainthood. We are saints that occasionally sin. And, uh, well, even these people, that these pastors that we've placed on pedestals, and they are amazing people and women, men and women of God. Don't get me wrong about that. But I guarantee you, they sin. Some of them sin more than others, worse than others. And we're going to celebrate their life. We're going to look at their accomplishments of their sacrifice, of their dedication. We're going to look at their calling, their giftings, and how they were blessed by being faithful. Yesterday, I did a a marriage counseling session. So a couple in the community, they don't attend our church, maybe online. Uh, but having some marriage problems. And I brought him in, hanging out with him in the Creekside room, just kind of going over what the issue is um, before I get into what I, the, the, the main idea behind this little story. Before I do that, gentlemen, let me speak to you man to man, mono e mono. Do not lie to your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> do not tell half truths. Do not tell white lies. She will find out. Amen. Amen. Some day, sooner or later, she's gonna find out. And so I'm just hanging out. I'm like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what this guy's going through. And so, just we give this uh, this little assessment. It's amazing. It's such it's such a, a powerful tool that we use in counseling ministry. And so it's geared for marriages and premarital counseling. And if you want to be uh, if you're going to get married, if you want premarital counseling, hit us up. We'll do it for free. If you are if you in need of marriage counseling, hit us up. I would love to do your marriage counseling. It's, it gets good for everyone. Um, but this poor guy, this poor guy, such an idiot. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I mean that because I could relate to him. Now, he didn't do anything horrible. Like, there was, like this is fixable stuff, right? The, what, well, you don't know what was going on. It was a fixable situation. And I could relate to him. I can call him a name because, well, I'm a lot like that guy. And in this little assessment, it gives you a little grid. It's kind of like um, Myers-Briggs for marriage or something like that, yeah? And so it gets you on a, puts you on this little personality grid. And his wife is a cooperating spouse. She's very sweet, very detail-oriented. She wants to come alongside and support, which is a huge, that's a huge benefit in any marriage is when, when your spouse wants to come alongside and support and uh, you know, push you forward in your dreams and your career and, and your well-being. It's a, she's an amazing gal. But, um, well... If you are like me and my friend here who is a pioneering spouse, that means our head is not here on earth. It's somewhere else. And so the big part, like, I could just like totally relate to this guy because, well, he's daydreaming all the time. What are you doing, honey? Uh, nothing. What are you looking at, honey? Uh, nothing. You know, this, that's like the foundation of the little white. This is, he's got himself in trouble because you know, I, who knows, right? And if they don't do the work, if they're not communicating well, if he's not being transparent and coming out of the clouds and not trying to create something new, um, her, her natural ability, her natural skill to come along uh, beside him and support him will get uh, morphed and, tra- and uh, uh, manip- uh, uh, mutated 
into nagging. Gentlemen, how many people like to be nagged? All right, I don't either. So don't lie <laughs> and then start talking to your spouse. Amen? Okay, there we go. Um, but what I saw in this, and I could see it in a moment, in an instant, because there were those, you know, they're gonna, this couple's going to be fine, but there, there was a frustration there. And again, I know this guy because I am this guy. Like, we tested on the same level. It's like, oh, man, you're so screwed. <laughs> um, so I know this guy. And have you, ever wa- have you ever noticed that sometimes the problem is that actually not the problem? The problem that we're working on is nothing more than a manifestation of a deeper problem? And what I could see, the reason why this guy was uh, in the clouds is because he was not functioning inside of his calling. Responsible, hardworking, professional, right? He's got his act together. They're going to buy a big house, starting a new life, beautiful wife. Everything is coming together, and the dude's miserable. You could see it all over him, squirming in the chair. And it's not like he didn't want to be there. He wanted to be there, but like you could just see it all over him. He's just miserable. I'm like, dude, what do you do for a living? Well, I do this, and you know, I'm a claims adjuster, and I, you know, I'm punching the clock nine to five. And and it didn't take too long for me to figure out, oh, this guy's not doing what he's supposed to be doing in life. He's not inside of his calling. He's a pioneer. He needs to be out there creating something, blazing a trail. He needs, to, he needs to have a plan for his future that is going to take them to the next level. He's not okay with the status quo. He needs change. Um, the very thing that attracted his wife to him could also be the very thing that will drive her nuts. Until he finds and fulfills his calling. I believe that the calling that God places on our lives is natural, meaning that he has made us and he's designed us in a very specific way with very specific personality types and tendencies. And the calling... is in the natural, but it's also in the spiritual. Meaning that the calling is not necessarily a spiritual gift. It's how God has made you in your personality. So even your closest friends who are full-blown atheists that have no spiritual dimension in them whatsoever, you know, even they, if they can hang out with you long enough and maybe take some psychology classes, they might be able to figure out what your calling is. Spiritual gifts are a different game altogether, but callings is vitally important. A lot of people are functioning in the wrong calling, and there's frustration there. They're frustrated with life. They're frustrated with their relationships. They might even be frustrated with God, and they have no re- They don't know why, but the reason why is because they're functioning outside of their calling. All right, get your Bibles out. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul is communicating to people just like you. I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. Amen? That's what I want. I want to live worthy of my calling. The calling that God's placed on my life not on someone else's life. The calling that you have received. All right, everybody needs to hear this these days. Be completely humble and gentle. Uh, Being patient. Who writes this stuff? We don't want to read this, right? (laughs) Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The world, might be doing, the world might not be doing this, but we here at Granite Creek are going to strive and we're going to do this. The bond of peace, unity, harmony, humility, 
gentleness. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were all called to, to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But each one of you, each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. And then we're going to skip over to 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we each reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what we want. That's what I want. I want to obtain the fullness of Christ. I want to reach maturity. I want to have unity with people that I am doing life with. But let's talk about he has given some of us to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What? Okay. First few of those words are very weird sounding words. Wouldn't you agree? An apostle. What in the world is an apostle? Well, my friend here is an apostle. He doesn't even know it yet. He's a pioneer. Can't sit still. He's always dreaming up new things. Working angles. He's an apostle. He doesn't know it. An apostle is a calling where... You are willing and commissioned to blaze a new trail, to make something happen that did not exist before, to maybe start a new church, to maybe start a home group, to, to have that, that ambition and the drive to expand the kingdom of heaven. One of the apostles that we'll be talking about, I mentioned him earlier, is Pastor John Wember. He, he, he blazed a trail. Basically, he started a new culture that didn't exist before inside the kingdom of God. Apostles are uh, they're up in the sky. They're, they're big picture type of people. And again, part of their problem is their head is in the clouds maybe a little too long. But they're up in the sky. They're looking down. They, they, they see... An apostle can see what's taking place inside of communities, inside of congregations. Sometimes apostles are called in to help in certain situations where there doesn't seem to be a solution because people are so stuck in their ways that they can't get out. But an apostle can pull you out of a problem that you didn't see that, you're, that you were in. They can, they can mediate issues. They're, they're, they're amazing. I want to share uh, in this little story that we had uh, this week. It was... Uh, Thursday, Thursday, we were, we were cleaning up our tree that came down, um, putting it all in a dumpster. It took two dumpsters to fill it up. We've got another dumpster to go, and then Ed's going to chop the whole thing up, my, my pretty tree that, that I didn't want to take out. Anyway, a big giant hawk just perched on one of the branches, not the one that was destroyed, but the one next to it, big giant hawk just perched up there right next to the sign that says, Get to Know God. And he sat there for at least 30 minutes. And the pastoral staff, we were just hanging out there, just looking at him, just honestly admiring the nature and the beauty and the majesty of this ginormous hawk well-fed from all of the bunnies that are around here. So gorgeous. We have been ministering in this building for over 30 years. Um, Dad's been here since 1998. I remember even being a boy and coming in and seeing this when Pastor Byther first bought this building. And never once in all of those years 
have we ever seen a big giant hawk just sit there and hang out with us? I got close. I'm like, I want to see how close I can get. And then I got closer and I got closer and I got closer. And then, you know, once you get close enough to see their little eyeballs and how sharp their claws are, you get a little scared. Like, this guy could scratch my eyes out. I'm gonna, so I, I, I could have gotten closer, but that, that wouldn't have been too bright. I got so close to this thing. I have never in my entire life been that close to a wild hawk. So if you want to see it, you can follow me on Instagram. It's really cool. Could it be that God is speaking to us through his creation, through an animal? Uh, Mako saw the post. She was at home, and she sent me all this stuff, the, the symbolism of hawks in the Bible, the symbolism of a hawk in the Bible uh, from the book of Job, which, we were also, which is also in our reading plan, uh, incidentally, the same week that we were going over it. Um, Job talks about hawks. Again, obviously, they're up above, but they're fast. They move quickly. And, you know, you've seen, these, you've seen these guys hunt in this area. They're up there for a very long time, longevity. And so I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to prophesy over our church. We're going to step into a season where things are going to move fast. They're going to be exciting. We're going to kill some bunnies. Okay, maybe that's a little too far. <laughs> We're going to eat well. Amen. And this revival is going to be long-lasting. There's going to be a longevity to it. We're going to soar high. We're going to soar long. Well, so that's, so that's one way that God speaks to us. So an apostle can come in and do that, but that's what, that's what prophets do too. So the next thing that a prophet is, is a prophet will come in, and uh, it sounds so weird. Let me tell you something. If you ever meet somebody in a church setting, and they have a business card, and they have prophet as, you know, you know prophet Jim, uh, don't hang out with those people. I'm being serious. I mean, I'm partly joking, but I'm being serious. Self-appointed prophets are a problem. I know it's a little judgy, but just in my own experience, people that, that have profit on their business card and they're not associated with the church specifically, they're not under the authority of a pastor or an apostle, those people are a hot mess. Don't listen to people that are not plugged into church. But you, you can be a prophet. Maybe that's your calling. Josh, that's the, Josh, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Is it? Can you, are, do, you, do you just naturally encourage people? Can you, see, can you see maybe in the spirit or maybe even in the natural, like what's going on in somebody's life? You see the way that they walk. Their, their shoulders are hunched down. They're a little sad, whatever. And you're able to read it. And then God's even able to show you something specifically. And if this individual is even highlighted in your mind and you have something encouraging to say, you're a prophet. You're, you're, you're functioning inside of that calling of being a prophet. And we're going to encourage you to continue to do so. Secondly, as uh, evangelists, that's another big, giant, scary, churchy word. We're going to strip out the whole idea of, of what an evangelist is. We will be talking about the great evangelist, Billy Graham. I mean, if anybody had the right to put a title on their business card, it's Billy Graham. He can put evangelist. He could have put prophet. He could have put an apostle on his business card, and everybody should be okay with that. Because he learned how not only to submit to the Lord, he learned how to submit to his organization. He was a great man. An evangelist who led millions to the Lord. Millions. 
His heart burned for salvation. We'll hit on Amy Simple McPherson, too. Her heart, she'll even say, my, my heart is burning for the lost to reach this broken world. You could be an evangelist and not even know it. Our greatest evangelist inside of this church, I'm not going to tell you who it is because I'll probably embarrass her because she's that type of a person where she doesn't want to be recognized. She doesn't want to be put on, you know, she doesn't want the limelight. She's very behind the scenes. She's very, she's very introverted, ironically. She doesn't, she doesn't like to do big events and hang out with groups of people. But she is by far the most social individual who shares the most about Granite Creek and has brought more people into this church than anybody that I know. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. Sorry. She's an evangelist and she doesn't even realize it. So what's your calling? You might not even realize it. A pastor is a shepherd who is taking care of people, yes. taking care of his flock. Very simple thing, very complex thing. In some ways, pastors have got to function in all these other little different things. But their main objective is to make sure that, the that there's peace and unity and harmony inside of the community. That everybody is becoming more and more like Christ to the best of their abilities each and every day. So, you know, you might not be on staff, but you very well could be a pastor or a shepherd. You could be. If you have you have the bandwidth to sit down and listen to somebody and what they're going through, you just might be a pastor. That could be your calling. And then finally, a teacher. I mean, this book, man, it's really cool, and it needs to be taught. It's God's book. God has a book. It's right here, and it needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught properly. It is you know, there's some confusing things in here. I, I'm not going to say that, that there's not. It needs to be properly interpreted. Part of the problem inside of Christianity today, it's been improperly interpreted. It's been interpreted as being myth. It's been interpreted as being false. It's been interpreted as being a history book. It's been interpreted as being God, man's account with God instead of God's love letter to humanity. So it needs to be taught in ways that say this is God's book to us and it is good and it is useful and it, 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 it is life breathing and it is living and it is active. And we need teachers that can teach that. So these are the callings. OK, so this is what I want you to write down. I want you to write down your calling. Bullet point number two, halfway down your page. I want you to write down your gifts, your giftings. And number three, near the bottom, I want you to write down your fulfillment. Because you don't want to end up like my friend who is not fulfilled. He's squirming in his chair. He knows that there's something that's not right in his life because he hasn't found his calling. So. I want you to think about these things in three tiers. What is your calling? Like We're going to put you into one of these five categories, or you're going to put yourself into one of these five categories. We did this with the staff not too long ago, the staff and the elders, and we learned that you know there is a dominant calling on people's lives, but there's also maybe a sub-calling. So the staff and the elders, they said, well, Josh, <laughs> I'm apostle, and I'm a pastor. So those are my cat. That's how people see me. Now, you, people are going to get around you, and they're going to see you in very specific ways. So during this, during this series, when we are exploring what your calling is, and you're going to be doing a lot of self-exploration yourself, what is your calling? Do you know, do you know what your calling is? And I'm going to say it needs to be in one of these five categories. And I know that that might not, that means seem really abstract. But I guarantee you, you're going to fit into one of them, maybe two. What is your calling? Second tier down, do you know what your gifts are? 
your spiritual gifts. Let me read. I'll read the long list. There's, um, there's some spiritual gifts are talked about by Paul in several different passages in the Bible. In uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So God's going to give you gifts. He's going to give you tools. He's going to give you hammers, nails, screwdrivers, axes. He's going to give you specific tools to work on specific problems inside of your life and when you are engaging in the kingdom of heaven. For the common good, your gifts are not for you to play with. You have to share. Uh, If you're an only child like me, it's hard to share your gifts. I'm not technically an only child. I have an 18-year-old sister, which means my parents have two only children. (laughs) Oh, she's not. There's 18 years between us. Okay, sorry. I was 18 when they had my sister. Same parents, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> it's not an act. And it, wasn't, it was planned. They planned this. They're like, oh, man, Josh is going away to college. We better have another kid or we're going to kill each other. <laughs> no. All right. To one, there is given through the Spirit... Capital S, the message of wisdom. So you might have a prophetic calling and a gift of wisdom. Do you see how that works? There's a calling and then there's a gift. And to another, the message of knowledge meaning that you could be you could have the calling of a pastor and the gift of knowledge meaning that you're going to be a, ta- a pastor that knows how to teach very well it's going to have the information down by means of the same spirit to another faith one of my favorite gifts didn't necessarily have it when i began but i am learning how to have the gift of faith. What an incredible tool to have in your belt. Like I've got my own faith and what I've learned about my own faith is that it kind of stinks. I'd rather have the the gift of faith from the spirit. That's that's an awesome faith. To another gifts of healing by that same one spirit. So you can be an apostle, but it's also a healer that functions in that gift. Yeah. And to another, miraculous powers. So uh, maybe you're going to be, um, you know, pulling fish out of the sea or something. To another, prophecy. So there's an office of prophet, but there's also the gift of prophecy. All right. It's a little bit different. To another, the distinguishing of spirits. We call this discernment. And to another, the speaking in different kinds of tongues. We call that speaking in tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. So sometimes those need to be interpreted. They say that they should. And all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each just as He determines. So if God has determined that you need a specific gift for your encouragement, for your equipping... For advancing the kingdom of God, if he determines it, he will give it. You have to receive it. Amen? Amen. Like you have to receive. Like if if God gives you the spiritual gift of healing, he gives it. You have it. You didn't earn it. You didn't go to a conference. You didn't figure out, you know, all these different spiritual maneuvers to get yourself super spiritual so that you can do it. When God gives you the gift, you have it. Open it up. Use it. Take a chance. Take a risk. It's there. What's your calling? Inside of your calling, what are your gifts? 
You can swap them out. You can. I know. It's weird. Like you can actually desire more gifts. Uh, Chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You can desire this stuff. Like you can desire the gift of healing, the gift of tongues. You're like, I don't know if I want that one. Uh, You do. I'm telling you, it's weird. Maybe it's weird. It's awkward. You want it. You want it. You want, to, you want it in your prayer life. Because the, the spiritual gift of divine language, it edifies you. That tool is like, uh, it's like fingernail clippers or soap. Like it, it's going to make you better. It's going to clean you up. It's going to get you into the spirit. You need that gift. Has God given it to you? I don't know. That's, that's a question you have to ask him. But desire it. Why not? Why not desire the weird ones? Desire, those, desire all of them. If anything seems interesting to you, say, God, well, is that a gift for me or not? How do, how, how do, I, how do I get that one? Desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Uh, okay, so the reason why Paul says that is because the prophecy is the encouraging gift. It's the gift that says, uh, you guys need to repent because God's got something better for you. He sees you the way that you don't see yourself. That's what prophets do. So that's a good gift. But uh, if you're really sick, healing is a good gift to go for too. All right, and then the last bit on your outline your rough outline that I just put together today is fulfillment. I have noticed that if somebody has a gift, we'll just go, we'll just go to the natural. Like they have the gift of uh, knowledge. Okay. Well, just like we read, they have the gift of knowledge, meaning that they can communicate God's word clearly. I've seen this. They have the gift of knowledge, but they're not clear what their calling is. Meaning I've seen people teach the word of God. It's been amazing, but they've done so outside of their anointing. And they didn't last long. They got frustrated and quit. So you've got to use your gifts inside of your calling or inside of your anointing. It's got to be that way or else you're going to burn yourself out and you're going to get frustrated. You have to use your gifts inside of your calling, inside of your anointing. And how do you know if that's working out right? Well, you are going to feel fulfillment. Yeah, she's got it, folks. Somebody's paying attention. Yeah, you're going to feel fulfilled. You're going to, and it's, she's, she's right, right, on the, right on the button, by the way, love. Because the fulfillment of your calling, the fulfillment and the kingdom advance of the, the, the gifts of the Spirit is something that we call the fruit of the Spirit. All right, let me read these to you. This is Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the the results of you functioning with your God-given tools of spiritual gifts, the result of finding and discovering your calling are these. But the fruit of the Spirit, again, capital S, is love. And love is actually a capital L-O-V-E here. It's, 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 Everything is going to fall under the category of love in this. This is what we call the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy. Like, we, like if you're doing it right, you're going to have some joy that you don't understand. Peace. The peace of God. It, it's there. I mean, the world could be burning down around you. But if, in your, if you're in your calling, you're functioning in your gifts, you're going to feel the peace of God which transcends Every single drama, hardship, pain, hurt. Everybody's favorite, patience. Woo! Woo! 
Are we patient? Heck no, we're Americans. Okay. Should I say any more on that one? No. Kindness. Uh, is the church marked by kindness these days? Ours is. I don't know about those other guys. Our church is marked by kindness. If you, if you have the calling, okay, if you have the calling of an evangelist, right, if you want to share the, the word of God, if you want to see uh, nations follow the Lord, if you want to see cultures transformed, if you want to see communities saved for Jesus Christ, if you want to see these things, you cannot do it and not be kind. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not the Bible thumping, finger pointing, name calling, I'm going to shoot you in the face if you don't know Jesus thing. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not logic. It's not arguing. It's just kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness, this word again, gentleness, and everybody's favorite, self-control. So these are the marks. These are the results. This is the fulfillment of knowing your calling and functioning inside of your gifts. That's how you'll feel. You won't feel, as Pastor Larry talked about earlier, you won't feel self-righteous and justified and a warrior. I mean, well, I mean, maybe a warrior, but you're not going to be mean. You're not going to be angry. That, that anger is not a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Landon, come on up. Your calling, your calling will speak to your purpose. Ultimately, we're going after what's your life purpose here. Your calling is going to speak to your purpose. Your spiritual gifts, your spiritual gifts are going to reflect your connectedness to your communities. Like if you're not, if you're not using spiritual gifts, you're not connected to the body of Christ. That one's a really harsh thing to think about. Now, just, just take a chance and try some gifts. Stay connected. That this might mean as simple picking up the phone and giving somebody an encouraging word, dragging somebody away and praying for them when they're having a hard time or when they're sick. Your spiritual gifts will reflect your connectedness to the body of Christ. If you're not using them, you're not connected. And the fruit, the results, you should be fulfilled. Like fulfilled, like overflowing with joy. Going through this equipping series will bring you joy. It will bring you connectedness and purpose. And I want to encourage you to join us and be faithful to this gathering as we equip the saints, which is you. We're going to equip. We're going to do. We're going to practice. Some of our Sunday mornings, they're going to be like workshops. You okay with that? I'm going to train you. We're going to train you. We've got the best team in the world. We can do this. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the calling that you've placed on every single person in this room. And God, right now, we pray that they will accept the call and step into their anointings. God, I thank you for gifted people, resourced people in the Spirit, that know how to encourage the church. And we ask and we desperately desire more spiritual gifts. God, and may we find, may we find that peace for our souls, that rest, that joy, that patience, that humility, that self-control. May we find your fulfillment now, now, Lord, not when we die. May we find fulfillment now in the name of Jesus.
our confidence. It's your faithfulness. We will rest on your promises. Our confidence is your faithfulness because faithful you are. given to the Lord this morning. We've given him our worship, given him our tithes, we've given him our ears, maybe even our hearts. And now the Lord wants to give to you. He wants you to receive communion for the purpose of of the ultimate gift of sitting at his table, the salvation of our souls. He wants to give you this gift this morning, the gift of unity, of being a part of his body. Receive the body of Christ and know that you have a part to play in it. One of my biggest fears about doing communion every Sunday is that it was going to turn into some esoteric religious experience. But for me, it is such a powerful reminder and a symbol that I am a saint that occasionally sins. And when I take of this cup, there, he, he's forgiving all of my sins, past, present, and future. And they're obliterated. They don't exist anymore. So I love entering into sainthood each and every Sunday. So receive the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, to be gracious towards you, to turn towards you in your times of need. The one who has called you, he's got a calling for your life. He is faithful and he will equip you with everything that you need for fulfillment in this world today. God bless you guys. Have an incredible week. See you soon.